Question one. A 60-year-old patient presents with sudden onset of weakness and loss of coordination in the right arm and leg. An MRI reveals a lesion in the brain. Based on the symptoms and location of the lesion, which part of the brain is most likely affected? A. Left percentile gyrus. B. Right percentile gyrus. C. Left postcentral gyrus. D. Right postcentral gyrus. Correct answer. A. Left percentile gyrus. Explanation. The percentile gyrus is the primary motor cortex responsible for voluntary motor movements. Lesions in this area can cause motor deficits. Because the motor pathways decussate, cross, at the medulla, a lesion in the left percentile gyrus affects the right side of the body. Hence, the sudden weakness and loss of coordination in the right arm and leg indicate a lesion in the left percentile gyrus. The postcentral gyrus is the primary somatosensory cortex, which would cause sensory deficits rather than motor deficits. Question 2. A 45-year-old male with a history of hypertension is admitted to the hospital following a myocardial infarction. He expresses feelings of guilt and helplessness about his condition. Which of the following psychosocial interventions is most appropriate for addressing his emotional state? A. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy CBT. B. Psychoanalysis. C. Electroconvulsive Therapy ACT. D. Group Therapy. Correct answer. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy CBT Explanation Cognitive Behavioral Therapy CBT is an effective intervention for addressing feelings of guilt and helplessness. It helps patients identify and change negative thought patterns and behaviors. Psychoanalysis is a long-term therapy not suited for acute emotional distress. Electroconvulsive therapy ec, is used for severe depression, usually when other treatments have failed and is not appropriate for initial intervention in the scenario. Group therapy can be helpful but is more suitable for ongoing support rather than addressing acute emotional crises. Question 3. Mr. Smith, a 35-year-old man, has been experiencing persistent low mood, anhedonia, and fatigue for the past six months. He also reports difficulty concentrating and feelings of worthlessness. He has no history of manic or hypomanic episodes. Based on these symptoms, what is the most likely diagnosis? A. Bipolar disorder. B. Major depressive disorder. C. Generalized Anxiety Disorder D. Persistent Depressive Disorder Correct answer B. Major Depressive Disorder Explanation Mr. Smith's symptoms are consistent with Major Depressive Disorder, MDD, characterized by a persistently low mood, loss of interest in activities, anhedonia, and other symptoms like fatigue, difficulty concentrating, and feelings of worthlessness lasting for at least two weeks. Bipolar disorder includes episodes of mania or hypomania, which Mr. Smith does not report. Generalized anxiety disorder involves excessive worry but does not primarily present with depressive symptoms. Persistent depressive disorder, dysthymia, involves chronic depression but typically with less severe symptoms than MDD and lasting for at least two years. Question 4. A patient is unable to abduct a shoulder due to a nerve injury. Which nerve is most likely damaged? A. Radial nerve. B. Axillary nerve. C. Ulnar nerve. D. Median nerve. Correct answer. B. Axillary nerve. Explanation. The axillary nerve innervates the deltoid muscle, which is responsible for abducting the shoulder. Damage to this nerve impairs the ability to abduct the shoulder. The radial nerve primarily affects extension of the elbow, wrist, and fingers. The ulnar nerve is involved in movements and sensation of the forearm and hand, particularly the fine motor movements of the fingers. The median nerve controls the muscles of the anterior forearm and some muscles of the hand, particularly those involved in flexion and pronation. Question 5. A patient presents with severe fatigue and muscle weakness. Blood tests reveal elevated levels of lactate, a defect in which of the following metabolic pathways is most likely responsible for this condition? A. Glycogenolysis. B. Citric acid cycle. C. Glycolysis. D. Beta oxidation. Correct answer. B. Citric Acid Cycle Explanation The citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, is a crucial metabolic pathway that generates ATP through the oxidation of acetalco derived from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. A defect in the citric acid cycle leads to an accumulation of lactate as cells rely more on anaerobic glycolysis for energy, resulting in lactate production. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of glycogen into glucose and does not directly cause lactate accumulation. Glycolysis is the process of breaking down glucose into pyruvate, and defects here typically result in other metabolic issues. 
Beta oxidation is the breakdown of fatty acids into acetalco and does not directly relate to lactate production. Question 6. Mr. Thompson, a 45-year-old man, comes to the clinic with a high fever, cough, and chest pain. A chest x-ray shows lobar consolidation, and a sputum culture reveals gram-positive cocci in pairs. Which organism is most likely responsible for Mr. Thompson's pneumonia? A. Streptococcus pneumoniae. B. Staphylococcus aureus. C. Mycoplasma pneumoniae. D. Klebsiella pneumoniae. Correct answer. A. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Explanation. Streptococcus pneumoniae is a gram-positive coccus that often appears in pairs, diplococci, and is a common cause of lobar pneumoniae, especially in adults. It typically presents with high fever, productive cough, chest pain, and lobar consolidation on x-ray. Staphylococcus aureus, another gram-positive organism, more commonly causes bronchopneumonia and may be associated with post-viral infection pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia causes atypical pneumonia with milder symptoms and diffuse infiltrates on x-ray. Klebsiella pneumonia is a gram-negative bacillus associated with pneumonia in alcoholics and individuals with chronic illnesses, often producing a current jelly sputum. Question 7. A 22-year-old woman presents with recurrent sinus infections and bronchitis. Laboratory tests reveal significantly low levels of all immunoglobulin classes. Which immune efficiency disorder is most likely? A. Selective agar deficiency. B. Common variable immune efficiency. C. Vid. C. Severe combined immune efficiency. SID. D. DiGeorge syndrome. Correct answer. B. Common variable immune efficiency. C. Vid. Explanation. Common variable immune efficiency. C. Vid is characterized by low levels of immune globulins, ig iga, and often I'm, and increased susceptibility to infections. It presents with recurrent sinus infections, bronchitis, and other respiratory infections. Selective iga deficiency involves low levels of iga but normal levels of other immune globulins. Severe combined immune efficiency, SID, involves profound defects in both T and B cell function leading to severe infections early in life. DeGeorge syndrome is caused by a deletion in chromosome 22 and presence with thymic hypoplasia leading to T-cell deficiency as well as congenital heart defects and other anomalies. Question A. Mr. Thompson, a 67-year-old man with a history of smoking and chronic bronchitis, presence with weight loss, hemoptysis, and a new onset of shoulder pain. A chest x-ray reveals a mass in the right upper lobe. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Tuberculosis. B. Pulmonary embolism. C. Squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, D. Asthma. Correct answer. C. Squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Explanation. Squamous cell carcinoma of the lung is a type of non-small cell lung cancer commonly associated with smoking. It often presents with symptoms such as weight loss, hemoptysis, coughing up blood, and can be associated with pancos tumors, which cause shoulder pain. Tuberculosis can present with hemoptysis and weight loss, but is less likely to present with a localized mass on chest x-ray. Pulmonary embolism typically presents with sudden onset chest pain and dyspnea, not a mass on x-ray. Asthma presents with episodic wheezing and dyspnea, not a persistent mass or hemoptysis. Question 9. A patient has started on a new antihypertensive medication that acts by inhibiting the angiotensin and converting enzyme ACE. Which adverse effect is most commonly associated with this class of drugs? A. Bradycardia. B. Dry cough. C. Hyperkalemia. D. Hypoglycemia. Correct answer. B. Dry cough. Explanation. A. C. Inhibitors such as enalapril and lisinopril are commonly associated with a dry cough due to the accumulation of bradykinin. Hyperkalemia can also occur but is less common than the cough. Bradycardia is not. A typical side effect that we'd see inhibitors it is more associated with beta blockers. Hypoglycemia is not a side effect of AC inhibitors it is more commonly associated with insulin or sulfonylureas. Question 10. A 45-year-old woman presents with jaundice, fatigue, and dark urine. Laboratory tests reveal elevated bilirubin, ALT, and AST levels. A liver biopsy shows ballooning degeneration, Mallory bodies, and neutrophilic infiltration. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Hepatitis B infection. B. Alcoholic hepatitis. C. Primary bilary cirrhosis. D. Wilson's disease. Correct answer. B. Alcoholic hepatitis. Explanation. 
Alcoholic hepatitis is characterized by ballooning degeneration of hepatocytes, Mallory bodies, intracytoplasmic inclusions of damaged keratin, and neutrophilic infiltration. It occurs in the context of chronic alcohol abuse and presence with jaundice, fatigue, and dark urine due to elevated bilirubin levels. Hepatitis B infection also causes elevated liver enzymes, but is characterized by ground glass hepatocytes on biopsy. Primary bilayary cirrhosis involves autoimmune destruction of intrahepatic bile ducts and is associated with anti-mitochondrial antibodies, not Mallory bodies. Wilson's diseases, a disorder of copper metabolism leading to hepatic and neurological symptoms, but its histopathological findings include cirrhosis and copper accumulation rather than Mallory bodies and neutrophils. Question 11. A 34-year-old woman is prescribed a new medication that is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, S3, for her depression. Which of the following is a common side effect of estrus? A. Sedation. B. Weight gain. C. Sexual dysfunction. D. Hypertension. Correct answer. C. Sexual dysfunction. Explanation. Sexual dysfunction, including decreased libido, anorgasmia, and delayed ejaculation, is a common side effect of estrus. Sedation can occur but is more common with sedating antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants, TCAS, or certain atypical antipsychotics. Weight gain can occur with some estrus, but it is more common with other classes of antidepressants like mirtazapine. Hypertension is not typically associated with estrus. Some can actually lower blood pressure slightly. Question 12. A 55-year-old man presents with exertional chest pain that radiates to his left arm and is relieved by rest. His symptoms are most likely due to a gastroesophageal reflux disease, GER, B. angina pectoris, C. myocardial infarction, D. costochondritis. Correct answer. B. angina pectoris. Explanation. Angina pectoris is chest pain due to myocardial ischemia that typically occurs with exertion and is relieved by rest. The pain often radiates to the left arm, neck, or jaw. Myocardial infarction presents similarly but is characterized by prolonged, unrelieved chest pain and associated with more severe ischemia and myocardial necrosis. G. RD can cause chest pain but is typically associated with meals and relieved by antacids. Costochondritis causes localized chest pain that is reproducible with palpation of the chest wall and is not typically related to exertion. Question 13. A patient is prescribed a beta blocker for hypertension. Which mechanism of action explains how beta blockers reduce blood pressure? A. Inhibition of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. B. Blockade of beta adrenergic receptors. C. Vasodilation of peripheral blood vessels. D. Diuresis and reduction of blood volume. Correct answer. B. Blockade of beta adrenergic receptors. Explanation. Beta blockers reduce blood pressure primarily by blocking beta adrenergic receptors which decreases heart rate and contractility, leading to reduced cardiac output. While some beta blockers also inhibit the renin angiotens and aldosterone system to some extent, their primary mechanism is the blockade of beta adrenergic receptors. Bacidylation of peripheral blood vessels is more characteristic of calcium channel blockers or alpha adrenergic blockers. Diuresis and reduction of blood volume are the primary actions of diuretics, not beta blockers. Question 14. Mr. Smith. A 45-year-old man, presents to the emergency department with severe dehydration after participating in an outdoor marathon on a hot day. He complains of dizziness, weakness, and muscle cramps. Upon examination, his blood pressure is low, heart rate is elevated, and skin is dry. What physiological mechanism is primarily responsible for his symptoms? A. Decreased sympathetic nervous system activity. B. Increased parasympathetic nervous system activity. C. Activation of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. D. Inhibition of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Correct answer. C. Activation of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. Explanation. Severe dehydration triggers the activation of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system, ROS, as a compensatory mechanism to maintain blood pressure and volume. Renin is released from the kidneys, leading to the conversion of angiotensin into angiotensin I which is then converted to angiotensin I, I buy angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Angiotensin I, I stimulates aldosterone release from the adrenal glands, promoting sodium and water reabsorption in the kidneys and vasoconstriction to increase blood pressure. The symptoms of dizziness, weakness, and muscle cramps are indicative of decreased blood volume and perfusion due to dehydration, exacerbated by the activation of RAAS. Question 15. 
a retrospective cohort study is conducted to assess the association between smoking status and the development of lung cancer. Which of the following measures is used to quantify the strength of association between smoking and lung cancer in the study design? A. Odds ratio. B. Relative risk. C. P-value. D. Confidence interval. Correct answer. B. Relative risk. Explanation. Relative risk, RR, is the measure used to quantify the strength of association between an exposure, E. G. Smoking and an outcome, E. G lung cancer, in a cohort study. It represents the ratio of the risk of developing the outcome among exposed individuals compared to the risk among unexposed individuals. Odds ratio, or, is commonly used in case control studies. P-value assesses the statistical significance of an association, and confidence interval provides a range of values within which the true effect size is likely to lie. Question 16. A patient presents with a tumor that is secreting excessive amounts of aldosterone which of the following electrolyte abnormalities is most likely to be observed in this patient? A. Hypokalemia. B. Hyperkalemia. C. Hyponatremia. D. Hypernatremia. Correct answer. A. Hypokalemia. Explanation. Aldosterone is a hormone primarily responsible for regulating sodium and potassium balance in the body. Excessive aldosterone secretion, as seen in conditions like primary hyperaldosteronism, Kahn syndrome, leads to increased sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the kidneys, resulting in hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia would be expected if aldosterone levels were decreased or if there was aldosterone resistance. Hyponatremia or hypernatremia would not be directly related to aldosterone excess but may occur secondary to volume status changes associated with aldosterone-mediated sodium retention. Question 17. A patient with terminal cancer expresses a wish to discontinue life-sustaining treatment and receive palliative care only. The patient's family insists on continuing aggressive treatment despite the patient's wishes. What ethical principle should guide the physician's decision-making in this situation? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Justice. Correct answer. A. Autonomy. Explanation. Autonomy refers to the principle of respecting the patient's right to make their own decisions about their health care, even if those decisions are not in line with what others, including family members, may want. In this scenario, the patient has the capacity to make decisions and has expressed a clear wish to discontinue aggressive treatment. The physician's primary ethical obligation is to respect the patient's autonomy and engage in shared decision-making, ensuring that the patient's wishes and values are central to the decision-making process. Beneficence, option B, refers to the obligation to act in the patient's best interest, which may align with the patient's wish for palliative care. Non-maleficence, option C, refers to the duty to do no harm, which may support the decision to discontinue futile treatments. Justice, option D, involves fairness and equitable distribution of resources, which may not directly apply to this individual patient's situation. Question 18. A community health clinic implements a screening program for cervical cancer using pap smears. Which of the following best describes the goal of this screening program? A. Secondary prevention. B. Tertiary prevention. C. Primary prevention. D. Quaternary prevention. Correct answer. A. Secondary prevention. Explanation. Screening programs for cervical cancer using pap smears aim to detect precancerous lesions or early stage cancer in asymptomatic individuals, allowing for early intervention and treatment to prevent progression to advanced disease. This aligns with the concept of secondary prevention, which involves early detection and intervention to reduce the impact of a disease that has already developed. Tertiary prevention, option B, focuses on managing and reducing the impact of established disease to prevent complications and disabilities. Primary prevention, option C, aims to prevent the onset of disease through interventions such as vaccination or lifestyle modifications. Quaternary prevention, option D, involves actions taken to mitigate or avoid the consequences of unnecessary or excessive medical interventions. Question 19. Miss Ramirez, a 40-year-old woman, presents to her primary care physician for a routine checkup. She has a family history of breast cancer, with her mother and sister both being diagnosed in their 50s. What preventive measure should the physician recommend for Miss Ramirez based on her family history? A annual mammogram starting at age 45. B. Genetic testing for BRCA mutations. C. Lifestyle modifications to reduce breast cancer risk. D. Prophylactic mastectomy. Correct answer. 
B. Genetic testing for BRCA mutations. Explanation. Given MS, Ramirez's family history of breast cancer and first-degree relatives, mother and sister, she may have an increased risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, which is associated with mutations in the BRCA-URA genes. Genetic testing for BRCA mutations can help identify individuals at high risk for breast cancer, allowing for personalized screening and prevention strategies such as enhanced surveillance or risk-reducing surgeries. Annual mammograms, option A, may be recommended for women at average risk starting at age 40 or 50, depending on guidelines. Lifestyle modifications, option C, can help reduce overall cancer risk but may not be sufficient for individuals with significant hereditary risk. Prophylactic mastectomy, option D, is a risk-reducing option for women with BRCA mutations who have a high risk of developing breast cancer. Question 20. Dr. Rodriguez is evaluating a patient presenting with abdominal pain. During the physical examination, the patient reports rebound tenderness in the right lower quadrant. Based on this finding, what condition should be considered in the differential diagnosis? A. Acute appendicitis. B. Diverticulitis. C. Cholecystitis. D. Peptic ulcer disease. Correct answer. A. Acute appendicitis. Explanation. Rebound tenderness in the right lower quadrant is a classic clinical sign of acute appendicitis, which is inflammation of the appendix. This tenderness occurs when pressure is released from the area of the abdomen following palpation. Acute appendicitis is a surgical emergency that requires prompt evaluation and management to prevent complications such as perforation and peritonitis. Diverticulitis, option B, typically presents with left lower quadrant pain. Cholecystitis, option C, presence with right upper quadrant pain and may be associated with a positive Murphy's sign. Peptic ulcer disease, option D, typically presents with epigastric pain and may be exacerbated by food intake. Question 21. A patient with a history of hypertension presents to the emergency department with sudden onset chest pain radiating to the back. An electrocardiogram ec reveals segment elevation in the anterior leads. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Acute myocardial infarction. B. Aortic dissection. C. Pulmonary embolism. D. Pericarditis. Correct answer. B. Aortic dissection. Explanation. Sudden onset chest pain radiating to the back, often described as tearing or ripping, along with syn-segment elevation in the anterior leads on E. CG raises suspicion for aortic dissection. Aortic dissection is a life-threatening condition characterized by the separation of the layers of the aortic wall, leading to the formation of a false lumen. Prompt diagnosis and management are crucial to prevent complications such as aortic rupture. Acute myocardial infarction, option A, typically presents with chest pain in E. CG changes indicative of myocardial ischemia or infarction. Pulmonary embolism, option C, may present with chest pain and dyspnea but usually does not cause segment elevation on E. CG, pericarditis, option D, may cause chest pain that worsens with inspiration and is typically associated with diffuse segment elevation. Question 22. Mr. Thompson, a 55-year-old man, presents to his primary care physician with complaints of fatigue and unintentional weight loss over the past few months. He has a history of smoking and works in construction. Upon further questioning, he reports a chronic cough and occasional hemoptysis. What diagnostic evaluation should the physician consider based on Mr. Thompson's presentation? A. Chest X-ray. B. Serum electrolyte levels. C. Echocardiogram. D. Colonoscopy. Correct answer. A. Chest X-ray. Explanation. Given Mr. Thompson's symptoms of fatigue, unintentional weight loss, chronic cough, and occasional hemoptysis, along with a history of smoking and occupational exposure to construction materials, the physician should consider a chest X-ray as part of the initial evaluation. Chest X-ray can help identify abnormalities such as pulmonary nodules, infiltrates, or masses suggestive of underlying pulmonary pathology, including lung cancer, which is a significant concern in individuals with a history of smoking. Serum electrolyte levels, option B, may be indicated in certain clinical scenarios, such as evaluation for electrolyte imbalances, but are not specific to Mr. Thompson's presentation. Echocardiogram, option C, may be useful in evaluating cardiac function but is not indicated as the initial diagnostic test for his symptoms. Colonoscopy, option D, is not indicated based on his presenting complaints and should not be prioritized in the initial evaluation. Question 23. A 25-year-old female is diagnosed with schizophrenia. 
Which of the following is a positive symptom of schizophrenia? A. Affective flattening. B. Alogia. C. Delusions. D. Anhedonia. Correct answer. C. Delusions. Explanation. Positive symptoms of schizophrenia are those that represent an excess or distortion of normal functions, including delusions, false beliefs, and hallucinations, false sensory experiences, affective flattening, reduced emotional expression, alogia, poverty of speech, and anhedonia, lack of pleasure, are negative symptoms which indicate a reduction or a loss of normal functions. Positive symptoms are typically more responsive to antipsychotic treatment than negative symptoms. Question 24. Miss Garcia, a 50-year-old woman with diabetes, is struggling to manage her condition due to lack of understanding about her medication regimen. What is the best approach for her healthcare provider to take? A. Simply provide a pamphlet with detailed instructions. B. Schedule a follow-up visit in three months. C. Engage in shared decision-making and education about diabetes management. D. Refer her to a psychiatrist. Correct answer. C. Engage in shared decision-making and education about diabetes management. Explanation. Shared decision-making and patient education are critical in managing chronic conditions like diabetes. This approach ensures that MS. Garcia understands her medication regimen and the importance of adherence, leading to better health outcomes, providing. A pamphlet alone is insufficient as it may not address her specific concerns or comprehension levels. Scheduling a follow-up in three months without immediate intervention is inadequate. Referral to a psychiatrist is unnecessary unless there are underlying mental health issues impacting her diabetes management. Question 25. Which of the following cell types is primarily responsible for the production of extracellular matrix and connective tissue? A. Osteoblasts. B. Chondrocytes. C. Fibroblasts. D. Adipocytes. Correct answer. C. Fibroblasts. Explanation. Fibroblasts are the primary cells responsible for the production and maintenance of the extracellular matrix, ECM, and connective tissue. They secrete collagen, elastin, and other components of the CM. Osteoblasts are involved in bone formation. Chondrocytes are responsible for cartilage formation. And adipocytes store fat. Each of these cell types produces E. CM specific to their tissue type but fibroblasts are the main producers in general connective tissue. Question 26. Mr. Thompson, a 72-year-old man, presents with slurred speech and difficulty swallowing. An MRI shows a small infarct in the metal albumgata. Which cranial nerve is most likely affected? A. Cranial nerve via I. Facial nerve. B. Cranial nerve X. Bagus nerve. C. Cranial nerve XII. Hypoglossal nerve. D. Cranial nerve V. Trigeminal nerve. Correct answer. C. Cranial nerve XII, hypoglossal nerve. Explanation. The hypoglossal nerve, cranial ninovoma, controls the muscles of the tongue, which are essential for speech and swallowing. Damage to this nerve due to a metallurgy infarct can result in slurred speech, dysarpia, and difficulty swallowing, dysphagia. The facial nerve, cranial ninovoma, affects facial expression and taste, but not the primary functions of the tongue. The vagus nerve, cranial nerve X, affects many functions, including parasympathetic control of the heart and digestive tract, but not primarily the tongue's motor functions. The trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve V, is involved in facial sensation and mastication. Question 27. A five-year-old child presents with developmental delay, distinctive facial features, and a history of recurrent respiratory infections. Chromosome analysis reveals a deletion on chromosome 22. Which of the following syndromes is most likely? A. Turner syndrome. B. DeGeorge syndrome. C. Down syndrome. D. Klein-Falter syndrome. Correct answer. B. DeGeorge syndrome. Explanation. DeGeorge syndrome, also known as 22.2 deletion syndrome, is characterized by developmental delay. Distinctive facial features such as a small mouth, hooded eyelids, and a prominent nose, and recurrent infections due to thymic hypoplasia, which leads to T-cell immune deficiency. Turner syndrome is associated with a 45 x chiriathypin features such as short stature, wet neck, and gonadal dysgenesis. Down syndrome, or trisomy 21, presence with intellectual disability, characteristic facial features, and various congenital anomalies. Klein-Falter syndrome, 47 XE involves hypogonadism, tall stature, and infertility in males. Question 20. Mrs. Lee, a 60-year-old woman with a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 
cop presence with worsening cough increased sputum production and shortness of breath a sputum culture reveals gram negative rods that are oxidase positive and produce a greenish pigment which organism is most likely causing her symptoms a escherichia coli b pseudomonas aeruginosa c haemophilus influenzae d cub sale and pneumonia correct answer b pseudomonas aeruginosa explanation pseudomonas aeruginosa is a gram negative rod that is oxidase positive and produces a characteristic greenish pigment pyosanin it is a common pathogen in patients with chronic lung conditions such as copd and cystic fibrosis leading to exacerbations and infections Escherichia coli is a gram negative rod but is not typically associated with greenish pigment production or respiratory infections in this context haemophilus influenzae is a gram negative cockabacillus and a common cause of respiratory infections but does not produce a green pigment Plebsail and pneumonia is a gram negative rod associated with current jelly sputum but not with green pigment production question twenty nine a ten-year-old boy presents with a history of recurrent bacterial infections and eczema laboratory tests show elevated levels of ig which of the following immunodeficiencies is most likely a bruton's eggemoglobulinemia b hyperim syndrome c severe combined immunodeficiency sid d hyperig syndrome jobs syndrome correct answer d hyperig syndrome jobs syndrome explanation hyperig syndrome also known as jobs syndrome is characterized by recurrent bacterial infections eczema and markedly elevated levels of ig it is caused by mutations in the stat gene affecting neutrophil chemotaxis bruton's eggemoglobulinemia caused by mutations in the btk gene leads to a lack of b cells and low levels of all immunoglobulins presenting with recurrent infections but not elevated ig hyperim syndrome results from defects in cd ligand or cd causing elevated m and low levels of other immunoglobulins leading to recurrent infections but not elevated ig Severe combined immunodeficiency (SID) involves profound defects in both T and B cell function, leading to severe infections early in life without the characteristic elevated IG seen in Jobs syndrome. Question 30: Dr. Garcia is treating a patient with a metabolic disorder characterized by a deficiency in the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. What dietary advice should Dr. Garcia provide to manage this condition? A. Increase protein intake. B. Avoid foods high in phenylalanine c increase carbohydrate intake d avoid foods high in lysine correct answer b avoid foods high in phenylalanine explanation the patient likely has phenylcadenuria pau a metabolic disorder caused by a deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase which converts phenylalanine to tyrosine to manage pku patients should avoid foods high in phenylalanine such as high protein foods meat dairy nuts and certain artificial sweeteners aspartame increasing protein intake would exacerbate the condition increasing carbohydrate intake is not directly relevant to managing pku and avoiding foods high in lysine is unnecessary as lysine metabolism is not affected in pku question thirty one a researcher is studying the mechanisms of viral pathogenesis and identifies a virus that integrates its genome into the host cell dna which type of virus is the researcher most likely studying a influenza virus b herpes simplex virus c human immunodeficiency virus hiv d rotavirus correct answer c human immunodeficiency virus hiv explanation human immunodeficiency virus hiv is a retrovirus that integrates its rna genome into the host cell dna through the action of reverse transcriptase and integrase enzymes this integration allows the virus to persist in the host cell and evade the immune system the influenza virus does not integrate its genome into host DNA, it replicates in the host cell cytoplasm. Herpes simplex virus can establish latency in host cells but does not integrate its genome into host DNA. Rotavirus is a double stranded RNA virus that replicates in the cytoplasm and does not integrate into the host genome. Question 32 A 60 year old woman presents with progressive shortness of breath and bilateral ankle swelling. On physical examination, she has distended neck veins and a positive hepatojugular reflux. Echocardiography reveals a decreased ejection fraction. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COP. B. Pulmonary embolism. C. Congestive heart failure. D. Core pulmonale. Correct answer. C. Congestive heart failure. Explanation. 
congestive heart failure chf is characterized by symptoms of fluid overload such as dyspnea peripheral edema and elevated jugular venous pressure a decreased ejection fraction on echocardiography confirms systolic heart failure copd typically presents with chronic cough and dyspnea but is not primarily associated with peripheral edema pulmonary embolism can cause sudden dyspnea and chest pain but not progressive fluid overload core pulmonary refers to right-sided heart failure due to chronic lung disease but does not typically involve a decreased ejection fraction question thirty three a patient is prescribed a calcium channel blocker for hypertension which of the following side effects is most commonly associated with this class of medication a hyperkalemia b constipation c bradycardia d hypoglycemia correct answer b constipation explanation calcium channel blockers particularly non dihydropyridines like verapamil are commonly associated with constipation hyperkalemia is more commonly associated with medications like ac inhibitors or potassium sparing diuretics bradycardia can occur with non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers but is less common than constipation hypoglycemia is typically associated with insulin or sulfonylureas not calcium channel blockers question thirty four miss peterson a fifty-year-old woman presents with jaundice and a history of chronic alcohol use physical examination reveals hepatomegaly and spider angiomas laboratory tests show elevated liver enzymes and a low albumin level what is the most likely diagnosis a acute viral hepatitis b non-alcoholic fatty liver disease NAFL. c alcoholic cirrhosis d wilson's disease correct answer c alcoholic cirrhosis explanation alcoholic cirrhosis is characterized by liver fibrosis due to chronic alcohol use leading to symptoms like jaundice hepatomegaly spider angiomas and hypobuminemia elevated liver enzymes indicate liver injury q viral hepatitis would present with more acute symptoms and higher transaminases without chronic stigmata like spider angiomas nafld can present with elevated liver enzymes but is not associated with chronic alcohol use Wilson's diseases, a genetic disorder of copper metabolism leading to liver and neurological symptoms, but is less common and typically diagnosed earlier in life. Question 35. A biopsy of a 55-year-old man's colon reveals adenocarcinoma. Which of the following is a known risk factor for the development of this condition? A. Smoking. B. Helicobacter pylori infection. C. Ulcerative colitis. D. Diabetes mellitus. Correct answer. C. Ulcerative colitis explanation ulcerative colitis is a known risk factor for the development of colorectal adenocarcinoma especially with long-standing disease smoking is more commonly associated with lung cancer and other cancers but not specifically colorectal cancer helicobacter pylori infection is a risk factor for gastric cancer and malt lymphoma diabetes mellitus is associated with an increased risk of various cancers but is not a specific risk factor for colorectal adenocarcinoma like ulcerative colitis Question 36. A patient with atrial fibrillation is prescribed warfarin. The primary mechanism by which warfarin exerts its anticoagulant effect is A. Inhibition of thrombin. B. Inhibition of platelet aggregation. C. Inhibition of vitamin K epoxide reductase. D. Inhibition of factors A. Correct answer. C. Inhibition of vitamin K epoxide reductase. Explanation. Warfarin exerts its anticoagulant effect by inhibiting vitamin K epoxide reductase, which is necessary for the gamma carboxylation of clotting factors II, VII, IX, and X. This leads to the production of non functional clotting factors and anticoagulation. Inhibition of thrombin is the mechanism of action of direct thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran. Inhibition of platelet aggregation is the mechanism of action of antiplatelet drugs like aspirin. Inhibition of factor Xi is the mechanism of action of direct factor Xi inhibitors like Riveroxepin. Question 37. A 45-year-old man presents with sudden severe chest pain radiating to his back. His blood pressure is significantly different between the right and left arms. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Acute myocardial infarction. B. Pulmonary embolism. C. Aortic dissection. D. Pericarditis. Correct answer. C. Aortic dissection. Explanation. Aortic dissection typically presents with sudden severe chest pain that radiates to the back and a significant difference in blood pressure between the arms due to involvement of the aorta. 
acute myocardial infarction can present with severe chest pain but does not typically cause a difference in blood pressure between the arms. Pulmonary embolism presents with sudden onset chest pain and dyspnea but not differential blood pressure. Pericarditis presents with chest pain that worsens with inspiration and lying down but does not cause differential blood pressure between arms. Question 30. During a sprint race, an athlete experiences an increase in heart rate and breathing rate to meet the increased demand for oxygen by the muscles. Which of the following physiological mechanisms is primarily responsible for coordinating this response? A. Sympathetic nervous system activation. B. Parasympathetic nervous system activation. C. Decreased levels of circulating adrenaline. D. Inhibition of the adrenal cortex. Correct answer. A. Sympathetic nervous system activation. Explanation. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the fight or flight response, which includes increasing heart rate and respiratory rate to deliver more oxygen to the muscles during physical activity. Activation of the sympathetic nervous system leads to the release of adrenaline, epinephrine, from the adrenal medulla, which acts on the heart and lungs to increase their activity. Parasympathetic nervous system activation would have the opposite effect, decreasing heart rate and respiratory rate. Inhibition of the adrenal cortex would reduce the production of cortisol and aldosterone but would not directly affect heart rate and breathing rate. Question 39. In a clinical trial evaluating the effectiveness of a new drug, the researchers randomized participants into two groups, treatment and control. Which of the following is the primary purpose of randomization in the study design? A. To ensure that participants receive the most appropriate treatment. B. To eliminate confounding variables. C. To increase the statistical power of the study. D. To ensure blinding of the participants and researchers. Correct answer. B. To eliminate confounding variables. Explanation. Randomization ensures that participants in each group are similar in all aspects except for the treatment they receive. This helps to eliminate confounding variables, which are factors that could influence the outcome of the study but are not the variables of interest. By minimizing confounding variables, randomization increases the internal validity of the study and allows for a more accurate assessment of the treatment's effectiveness. Blinding, option D, refers to concealing treatment assignment from participants and researchers to minimize bias, while statistical power, option C, refers to the study's ability to detect a true effect if it exists. Question 40. Mr. Rodriguez, a 55-year-old man, experiences a sudden feeling of lightheadedness and palpitations while climbing stairs. He has a history of hypertension and is taking medication to control it. What physiological mechanism is most likely responsible for his symptoms? A. Activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. B. Suppression of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. C. Beta blockade. D. Increased sympathetic nervous system activity. Correct answer. C. Beta blockade. Explanation. Beta blockers are medications commonly used to treat hypertension. They work by blocking beta adrenergic receptors, which decreases heart rate and contractility in susceptible individuals, especially those with underlying cardiovascular disease or on high doses of beta blockers. This can lead to decreased cardiac output and symptoms such as lightheadedness and palpitations, particularly during exertion. Activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, option A would lead to bradycardia and not typically cause palpitations. Suppression of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system, option B, would not directly cause these symptoms. Increased sympathetic nervous system activity, option D, would typically increase heart rate and contractility, not decrease them. Question 41. A physician is asked to participate in a pharmaceutical company-sponsored clinical trial testing a new medication for a rare genetic disorder. The physician has concerns about the potential risks and benefits of the experimental treatment. Which ethical principle should guide the physician's decision whether to participate in the trial? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Justice. Correct answer. C. Non-maleficence. Explanation. Non-maleficence is the ethical principle that emphasizes the duty to do no harm. In the context of clinical trials, Physicians must carefully weigh the potential risks and benefits of participating in research studies to ensure that patients are not exposed to unnecessary harm. If the physician has concerns about the safety or efficacy of the experimental treatment, they should prioritize non-maleficence by avoiding participation in the trial until these concerns are adequately addressed. Autonomy, option A, pertains to respecting patients' rights to make their own decisions 
while beneficence, option B, involves acting in the best interest of patients. Justice, option D, concerns fairness in the distribution of resources and access to healthcare. Question 42. A public health agency implements a community-wide vaccination program to prevent the spread of a highly contagious infectious disease. What level of prevention does this program primarily represent? A. Primary prevention. B. Secondary prevention. C. Tertiary prevention. D. Quaternary prevention. Correct answer. A. Primary prevention. Explanation. Primary prevention involves interventions aimed at preventing the onset of disease before it occurs. Vaccination programs, such as the one described, are classic examples of primary prevention because they aim to protect individuals from contracting infectious diseases in the first place. Secondary prevention, option B, involves early detection and intervention to prevent the progression of disease, while tertiary prevention, option C, focuses on managing established disease to prevent complications. Quaternary prevention, option D, refers to actions taken to avoid unnecessary or excessive medical interventions. Question 43. Dr. Nguyen is a physician working in a rural area with limited access to healthcare services. She encounters a patient who requires urgent medical care but lacks health insurance and cannot afford the necessary treatment. What ethical principles should guide Dr. Nguyen's decision-making in this situation? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Justice. Correct answer. B. Beneficence. Explanation. Beneficence is the ethical principle that emphasizes the duty to act in the best interest of the patient and promote their well-being. In this scenario, Dr. Nguyen should prioritize beneficence by providing the necessary medical care to the patient, regardless of their ability to pay or insurance status. Ensuring that patients receive timely and appropriate treatment is essential for promoting their health and addressing their medical needs. Autonomy, option A, involves respecting patients' rights to make their own decisions about their health care while non-maleficence, option C, pertains to avoiding harm. Justice, option D, concerns fairness and equitable distribution of healthcare resources, which may also be relevant but should not override the duty to beneficence in urgent medical situations. Question 44. A patient presents with a sudden onset of left-sided hemiparesis and sensory loss. MRI shows an infarct in the right cerebral hemisphere. Which specific area is most likely involved? A. Right thalamus. B. Right frontal lobe. C. Right parietal lobe. D. Right occipital lobe. Correct answer. B. Right frontal lobe. Explanation. The frontal lobe, specifically the percentile gyrus, primary motor cortex, is responsible for voluntary motor control. An infarct in the right frontal lobe can lead to left-sided hemiparesis due to the contralateral organization of motor control pathways. The right parietal lobe, while involved in sensory processing, would more likely cause sensory neglect rather than primary motor deficits. The right thalamus is involved in sensory relay but is not typically associated with direct motor control. The right occipital lobe is responsible for visual processing and would affect vision rather than motor control. Question 45. A 30-year-old male is diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. Which of the following medications is commonly first-line treatment for GAD de alprazolam? B. Fluoxetine. C. Lithium. D. Risperidone. Correct answer. B. Fluoxetine. Explanation. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SRIS, like fluoxetine, are considered first-line treatment for generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, due to their efficacy and safety profile. Alprazolam, a benzodiazepine, can be used for short-term relief but is not suitable for long-term management due to risks of dependence and tolerance. Lithium is primarily used for bipolar disorder, not GAD. Risperidone, an antipsychotic, is not a first-line treatment for GAD but may be used in treatment-resistant cases or if there are comorbid conditions. Question 46. Mrs. Patel. A 60-year-old woman, recently diagnosed with breast cancer, exhibits signs of severe anxiety about her diagnosis and upcoming treatment. What is the most appropriate initial approach to help her manage her anxiety? A. Prescribe benzodiazepines for immediate anxiety relief. B. Encourage her to avoid thinking about the diagnosis. C. Refer her to a support group for cancer patients. D. Suggest she reads more about breast cancer on the internet. Correct answer. C. Refer her to a support group for cancer patients. Explanation. 
Support groups provide a space for patients to share their experiences and receive emotional support from others facing similar challenges, which can significantly reduce anxiety. Prescribing benzodiazepines may provide immediate relief but does not address the underlying emotional needs and can lead to dependency. Avoiding the diagnosis is counterproductive and can worsen anxiety. While reading about breast cancer can be helpful, it might also increase anxiety if the information is not properly contextualized. Support groups offer a more balanced approach to managing anxiety through shared experiences and professional guidance. Question 47. Which type of epithelium is most likely to be found lining the alveoli of the lungs, facilitating gas exchange? A. Simple cuboidal epithelium. B. Stratified squamous epithelium. C. Simple squamous epithelium. D. Transitional epithelium. Correct answer. C. Simple squamous epithelium. Explanation. Simple squamous epithelium, composed of a single layer of flat cells, is ideal for facilitating gas exchange due to its thin structure, allowing efficient diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Simple cuboidal epithelium, while also a single layer, is thicker and primarily involved in secretion and absorption found in glands and ducts. Stratified squamous epithelium provides protection and is found in areas subject to abrasion such as the skin and the oral cavity. Transitional epithelium is specialized for stretching and is found in the urinary bladder. Question 48. Dr. Lee, a surgeon, is operating on a patient with severe trauma to the abdomen. During the procedure, she needs to identify the structure that forms the posterior boundary of the inguinal canal. Which structure should she identify? A. Inguinal ligament. B. Conjoint tendon. C. Transversalis fascia. D. Internal oblique muscle. Correct answer. C. Transversalis fascia. Explanation. The transversalis fascia forms the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Understanding the anatomy of the inguinal canal is crucial in surgeries involving the lower abdomen and groin. The inguinal ligament forms the inferior border of the inguinal canal. The conjoint tendon, formed by the aponeuroses of the internal oblique and transverses abdominis muscles, reinforces the posterior wall medially but does not constitute the entire posterior boundary. The internal oblique muscle contributes to the anterior wall of the inguinal canal. Question 49. A 30-year-old woman with a family history of breast cancer tests positive for a mutation in the BRCA gene. What is the primary function of the BRCA DNA? A. Oncogene that promotes cell division. B. Tumor suppressor gene involved in DNA repair. C. Proto-oncogene involved in apoptosis. D. Enzyme responsible for detoxifying carcinogens. Correct answer. B. Tumor suppressor gene involved in DNA repair. Explanation. The BRCA gene is a tumor suppressor gene that plays a critical role in the repair of DNA double-strand breaks. Mutations in urea impair the cell's ability to repair DNA damage, leading to genomic instability and an increased risk of developing cancers, particularly breast and ovarian cancer. Oncogenes promote cell division when mutated, but BRCA is not an oncogene. Proto-oncogenes are normal genes that can become oncogenes, but they are not involved in apoptosis. The BREA gene is not an enzyme responsible for detoxifying carcinogens. Question 50. Mr. Anderson, a 55-year-old diabetic patient, presents with a non-healing ulcer on his foot. Cultures from the wind grow, gram-positive cocci and clusters that are coagulase positive. Which organism is most likely responsible for the infection? A. Streptococcus pyogenes. B. Enterococcus fecalis. C. Staphylococcus aureus. D. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Correct answer. C. Staphylococcus aureus. Explanation. Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive coccus that forms clusters and is coagulase positive. It is a common cause of skin and soft tissue infections, particularly in diabetic patients who are prone to non-healing ulcers due to impaired circulation and immune response. Streptococcus pyogenes group. A streptococcus is also a gram-positive coccus but is coagulase negative and typically forms chains. Enterococcus fecalis is a gram-positive coccus that forms chains or pairs and is also coagulase negative. Streptococcus pneumoniae is a gram-positive coccus that typically appears in pairs, diplococci, and is primarily associated with respiratory infections. Question 51. A 35-year-old woman presents with fatigue, pallor, and recurrent infections. Laboratory tests reveal pancytopenia and a hypocellular bone marrow. 
which immune deficiency disorder is most likely associated with these findings? A. Severe combined immune deficiency, SID. B. Common variable immune deficiency, CVID. C. Aplastic anemia. D. Hyperarm syndrome. Correct answer. C. Aplastic anemia. Explanation. Aplastic anemia is a condition characterized by pancytopenia, a reduction in all blood cell types, and a hypocellular bone marrow, indicating a failure of hematopoiesis. This condition leads to fatigue, pallor due to anemia, and recurrent infections due to neutropenia. Severe combined immune efficiency, SID, presents with severe lymphopenia and a lack of both B and T cells, but does not typically cause pancytopenia. Common variable immune efficiency, CVID, involves low levels of immunoglobulins and recurrent infections, but not pancytopenia or hypocellular bone marrow. Hyperarm syndrome is characterized by elevated arm levels and low levels of other immunoglobulins, leading to recurrent infections, but it does not cause pancytopenia or bone marrow failure. Question 52. A patient is found to have a deficiency in the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. Which metabolic pathway is directly affected by this enzyme deficiency? A. Glycolysis. B. Glycogenolysis. C. Gluconogenesis. D. Beta-oxidation. Correct answer. C. Gluconogenesis. Explanation. Glucose 6-phosphatase is an enzyme involved in the final step of gluconogenesis, which converts glucose 6-phosphate into free glucose, allowing it to be released into the bloodstream. A deficiency in this enzyme impairs gluconogenesis and glycogenolysis, leading to hypoglycemia. Glycolysis is the process of breaking down glucose to produce energy and does not involve glucose 6-phosphatase. Beta-oxidation is the metabolic pathway for fatty acid breakdown and is unrelated to glucose 6-phosphatase. Question 53. A 25-year-old woman presents with a painless genital ulcer. Laboratory tests reveal a spirochete bacterium. Which of the following is the most likely causative organism? A. Trepoma pallidum. B. Chlamydia trachomatis. C. Haemophilus ducri. D. Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Correct answer. A. Trepoma pallidum. Explanation. Trepoma pallidum is a spirochete bacterium that causes syphilis. The primary stage is syphilis presence with a painless genital ulcer called a chancre. Chlamydia trachomatis can cause genital infections but does not typically produce a painless ulcer. Instead, it may cause urethritis or cervicitis. Haemophilus ducri causes chancroid, which presents with painful genital ulcers. Neisseria gonorrhoeae causes gonorrhea, which typically presents with purulent discharge and dysuria, not genital ulcers. Question 54. Dr. Martinez is evaluating a patient with an inherited metabolic disorder characterized by the accumulation of sphingomelanin cells. What is the most likely diagnosis and what enzyme is deficient in this condition? A. Gaucher disease, glucocerberosidase. B. Neiman Pick disease, sphingomelanase. C. Tay Sachs disease, hexosaminidase. D. Fabry disease, alpha galactosidase. Correct answer. B. Neiman Pick disease, sphingomelanase. Explanation. Neiman Pick disease is an inherited metabolic disorder caused by a deficiency in the enzyme sphingomelanase, leading to the accumulation of sphingomelanin cells. This condition presents with hepatosplenomaly, neurological deficits, and, in severe cases, early death. Gotcher disease is caused by a deficiency in glucocerebrosidase, leading to glucocerebroside accumulation. Tay-Sachs disease is caused by a deficiency in hexosaminidase A, resulting in GM ganglioside accumulation. Fabry disease is caused by a deficiency in alpha-galactosidase, leading to globotriosylceramide accumulation. Question 55. A patient with a history of hypertension and chronic kidney diseases prescribed a medication that acts as a selective antagonist to the angiotensin I, I type 1 receptor. Which of the following is a potential adverse effect associated with this class of medication? A. Hypokalemia. B. Hypernatremia. C. Dry cough. D. Peripheral edema. Correct answer. D. Peripheral edema. Explanation. Selective antagonists of the angiotensin I, I type 1 receptor, commonly known as angiotensin I, I receptor blockers, ARBs, can cause peripheral edema as an adverse effect due to their vast hydrolatory effects. Hypokalemia is more commonly associated with thiazide diuretics or loop diuretics. Hypernatremia is unlikely to occur as a result of ARB use. Dry cough is a common side effect of angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, inhibitors not ARBs. Question 56. A 60-year-old man presents with difficulty swallowing solids and liquids, unintentional weight loss, and a history of chronic heartburn, 
upper endoscopy reveals a circumferential mass at the gastroesophageal junction. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Barrett's esophagus. B. Esophageal adenocarcinoma. C. Esophageal varices. D. Achalasia. Correct answer. B. Esophageal adenocarcinoma. Explanation. Esophageal adenocarcinoma commonly presents with symptoms of dysphagia, weight loss, and a history of chronic heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Jer. The circumferential mass seen on upper endoscopy is characteristic. Barrett's esophagus is a promalignant condition characterized by metaplastic changes in the esophageal mucosa due to chronic G, RD, but does not present as a mass. Esophageal varices are dilated submucosal veins often associated with portal hypertension. A chalasia presence with dysphagia and aperistalsis of the esophagus but does not typically cause a mass. Question 57. Mrs. Garcia, a 68-year-old woman, presence with new onset atrial fibrillation. She has a history of chronic kidney disease and is prescribed a direct oral anticoagulant dope. What is the mechanism of action of dokes? A. Inhibition of vitamin K epoxide reductase. B. Inhibition of thrombin. C. Inhibition of platelet aggregation. D. Inhibition of factors A. Correct answer. D. Inhibition of factors A. Explanation. DOACS exert their anticoagulant effect primarily by inhibiting factor ZA, a key enzyme in the coagulation cascade. This inhibits the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, thereby reducing thrombin generation and preventing blood clot formation. Inhibition of vitamin K epoxide reductase is the mechanism of action of warfarin. Direct thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran directly inhibit thrombin. Inhibition of platelet aggregation is the mechanism of action of antiplatelet drugs like aspirin or clopidogrel. Question 58. A 35-year-old woman presents with diffuse hair loss and fatigue. Laboratory tests show low hemoglobin, low serum iron, and low ferritin levels. Which of the following conditions is most likely responsible for her symptoms? A. Iron deficiency anemia. B. Vitamin B deficiency anemia. C. Anemia of chronic disease. D. Aplastic anemia. Correct answer. A. Iron deficiency anemia. Explanation. Iron deficiency anemia is characterized by low hemoglobin, low serum iron, and low ferritin levels. Symptoms include fatigue, pallor, and diffuse hair loss. Vitamin B deficiency anemia would present with microcytic anemia and neurological symptoms. Anemia of chronic disease typically presents with normal or elevated ferritin levels and is associated with chronic inflammatory conditions. Aplastic anemia is characterized by pancytopenia and is not typically associated with hair loss. Question 59. A patient with a history of myocardial infarction is prescribed a medication that acts by inhibiting the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II. Which of the following is a potential adverse effect associated with this class of medication? A. Hyperkalemia. B. Hypokalemia. C. Dry cough. D. Peripheral neuropathy. Correct answer. Hyperkalemia. Explanation. Medications that inhibit the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II, such as angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, inhibitors, can cause hyperkalemia as an adverse effect due to reduced aldosterone secretion. Hypokalemia is unlikely to occur as a result of AC inhibitor use. Dry cough is a common side effect of AC inhibitors. Peripheral neuropathy is not typically associated with AC inhibitors. Question 60. A 40-year-old man presents with acute tonsil severe abdominal pain that radiates to his back. His amylase and lipase levels are markedly elevated. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Cholecystitis. B. Acute pancreatitis. C. Peptic ulcer disease. D. Appendicitis. Correct answer. B. Acute pancreatitis. Explanation. Q pancreatitis typically presents with acute tonsil severe abdominal pain that radiates to the back often associated with markedly elevated serum amylase and lipase levels. Cholecystitis presents with right upper quadrant abdominal pain and may be associated with fever and jaundice. Peptic ulcer disease presents with epigastric pain that is often relieved by food intake. Appendicitis presents with right lower quadrant abdominal pain that may migrate from periumbilical to the right lower quadrant. Question 61. A patient is diagnosed with diabetes insipidus, a condition characterized by excessive urination and thirst. Which of the following hormones is primarily responsible for regulating water balance in the kidneys? A. Insulin. B. Antidiuretic hormone. A. C. Cortisol. 
D. Thyroxine. Correct answer. B. Antidiuretic hormone A. Explanation. Antidiuretic hormone A, also known as vasopressin, plays a central role in regulating water balance by increasing water reabsorption in the kidneys. In diabetes insipidus, there is either a deficiency of ADH, central diabetes insipidus, or insensitivity of the kidneys to ADH, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, leading to excessive urination and thirst. Insulin, option A, regulates glucose metabolism and does not directly affect water balance. Cortisol, option C, is involved in stress response and metabolism. Thyroxine, option D, regulates metabolism and does not directly affect water balance. Question 62. A study aims to investigate the association between exposure to a certain chemical and the development of cancer. The researchers identify two groups, one exposed to the chemical and one not exposed. What type of study design is most appropriate for this investigation? A. Cohort study. B. Case control study. C. Cross-sectional study. D. Randomized controlled trial. Correct answer. B. Case control study. Explanation. In a case control study, participants are selected based on whether they have the outcome of interest, cases or not, controls, and then assessed for exposure status. This study design is appropriate when investigating rare outcomes such as cancer and allows for the efficient study of multiple exposures. Cohort studies, option A, follow a group of individuals over time to assess the development of outcomes based on exposure status. Cross-sectional studies, option C, assess both exposure and outcome status at a single point in time. Randomized controlled trials, option D, involve random allocation of participants to different interventions to assess their effects. Question 63. Mrs. Thompson, a 60-year-old woman, presents to the emergency department with severe shortness of breath and chest pain. She has a history of hypertension and is a smoker. Upon examination, she appears anxious and her blood pressure is elevated. What physiological mechanism is most likely responsible for her symptoms? A. Activation of the sympathetic nervous system. B. Activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. C. Suppression of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. D. Decreased levels of circulating catecholamines. Correct answer. A. Activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Explanation. Severe shortness of breath and chest pain in the context of hypertension and smoking history are suggestive of a cardiovascular event such as myocardial infarction. Activation of the sympathetic nervous system, often referred to as the fight or flight response, leads to increased heart rate, vest constriction, and increased blood pressure. This response is initiated in situations of stress or perceived threat such as acute myocardial infarction. Parasympathetic nervous system activation, option B would have the opposite effect, decreasing heart rate and blood pressure. Suppression of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, option C, would not cause acute symptoms. Decreased levels of circulating catecholamines, option D, would not be expected in a situation of acute stress or myocardial infarction. Question 64. A city experiences a significant increase in cases of foodborne illness traced back to a local restaurant. The Public Health Department conducts an investigation to identify the source of contamination and implement control measures. What level of prevention does this investigation primarily represent? A. Primary prevention. B. Secondary prevention. C. Tertiary prevention. D. Quaternary prevention. Correct answer. B. Secondary prevention. Explanation. Secondary prevention involves early detection and intervention to prevent the progression of disease or mitigate its impact. In this scenario, the public health investigation aims to identify and address cases of foodborne illness promptly, thereby preventing further spread of the disease and reducing its impact on affected individuals. Primary prevention, option A, focuses on preventing the onset of disease, while tertiary prevention, option C, involves managing established disease to prevent complications. Quaternary prevention, option D, refers to actions taken to avoid unnecessary or excessive medical interventions. Question 65. A patient with a history of heart failure and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COP, expresses a desire to forego aggressive life-sustaining treatments in the event of a terminal illness. What ethical principle supports the patient's right to make this decision? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Justice. Correct answer. A. Autonomy. Explanation. 
Autonomy refers to the principle of respecting patients' rights to make their own decisions about their health care based on their values and preferences. In this scenario, the patient's desire to forego aggressive life-sustaining treatments reflects their autonomous decision-making regarding their end-of-life care. Respecting the patient's autonomy involves honoring their wishes and involving them in shared decision-making processes. Beneficence, option B, involves acting in the patient's best interest, which may align with respecting the patient's autonomy. Non-maleficence, option C, pertains to avoiding harm, and justice, option D, concerns fairness and equitable distribution of healthcare resources. Question 66. Miss Parker, a 35-year-old woman, presents to her primary care physician for a routine checkup. She has a family history of colorectal cancer, with her father being diagnosed at age 50. What preventive measure should the physician recommend for Ms. Parker based on her family history? A. Colonoscopy screening starting at age 45. B. Genetic testing for Lynch syndrome. C. Annual fecal occult blood testing. D. Lifestyle modifications to reduce colorectal cancer risk. Correct answer. A. Colonoscopy screening starting at age 45. Explanation. Given Ms. Parker's family history of colorectal cancer in a first-degree relative, her father diagnosed at age 50, she may have an increased risk of developing the disease. Current guidelines recommend initiating colonoscopy screening at an earlier age, usually 10 years before the age of the affected relative's diagnosis, for individuals with a family history of colorectal cancer. This screening modality allows for the detection and removal of precancerous polyps, thereby reducing the risk of developing colorectal cancer. Genetic testing for Lynch syndrome, option B, may be considered in individuals with a strong family history of colorectal cancer, particularly if there are additional features suggestive of a hereditary cancer syndrome. Annual fecal occult blood testing, option C, may be part of colorectal cancer screening but is not the primary recommendation for individuals with significant family history. Lifestyle modifications, option D, can help reduce overall cancer risk but may not be sufficient for individuals with a strong hereditary predisposition to colorectal cancer. Question 67. A public health campaign encourages individuals to receive the influenza vaccine annually to reduce the spread of seasonal flu. What level of prevention does this campaign primarily represent? A. Primary prevention. B. Secondary prevention. C. Tertiary prevention. D. Quaternary prevention. Correct answer. A. Primary prevention. Explanation. Primary prevention aims to prevent the onset of disease before it occurs by targeting risk factors and promoting protective behaviors. In this scenario, the influenza vaccination campaign seeks to prevent individuals from contracting seasonal flu, thereby reducing the overall incidence of influenza-related illness and complications. Secondary prevention, option B, involves early detection and intervention to prevent disease progression, while tertiary prevention, option C, focuses on managing established disease to prevent complications. Quaternary prevention, option D, involves actions taken to avoid unnecessary or excessive medical interventions. Question 60. A patient with advanced dementia lacks decision-making capacity and does not have an advanced directive in place. What ethical principle guides decisions about the patient's medical care in this situation? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Paternalism. Correct answer. D. Paternalism. Explanation. Paternalism involves making decisions in the best interest of the patient when they are unable to make decisions for themselves. In cases where patients lack decision-making capacity and have not expressed their preferences through advanced directives, healthcare providers may rely on paternalistic decision-making to determine the most appropriate course of action for the patient's medical care. This often involves considering the patient's previously expressed values and wishes, as well as input from family members or surrogate decision makers. Autonomy, option A, refers to respecting patients' right to make their own decisions, while beneficence, option B, and non-maleficence, option C, involve acting in the patient's best interest and avoiding harm, respectively. Question 69. Mr. Thompson, a 70-year-old man, is diagnosed with terminal cancer and expresses a desire to explore complementary and alternative medicine, CAM, treatments alongside conventional cancer therapy. What ethical principle should guide the physician's response to Mr. Thompson's request? A. Autonomy. B. Beneficence. C. Non-maleficence. D. Informed consent. Correct answer. A. Autonomy. Explanation. 
Autonomy emphasizes respecting patients' rights to make their own decisions about their health care based on their values and preferences. In this scenario, Mr. Thompson's request to explore CAM treatments reflects his autonomous decision-making regarding his cancer care. The physician should respect Mr. Thompson's autonomy by engaging in shared decision-making, providing information about the risks and benefits of both conventional and CAM treatments, and supporting his choices within the bounds of ethical and evidence-based practice. Beneficence, option B, involves acting in the patient's best interest, which may include providing information about evidence-based treatment options. Non-maleficence, option C, pertains to avoiding harm and informed consent, option D, involves ensuring that patients are fully informed about proposed treatments and agree to them voluntarily. Question 70. A 45-year-old patient presents to the clinic with complaints of persistent, non-productive cough, dyspnea on exertion, and chest tightness. Physical examination reveals diffuse wheezing upon auscultation. What condition is most likely causing these symptoms? A. Asthma. B. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COP. C. Pneumonia. D. Pulmonary embolism. Correct answer. A. Asthma. Explanation. The patient's symptoms of persistent cough, dyspnea on exertion, chest tightness, and diffuse wheezing upon auscultation are classic features of asthma, a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways characterized by reversible airflow obstruction. Asthma exacerbations can be triggered by various factors, including allergens, exercise, and respiratory infections. Management typically involves bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroids to control inflammation and improve symptoms. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COP, option B, typically presents with a chronic productive cough, dyspnea, and wheezing, but it is more common in older patients with a significant smoking history. Pneumonia, option C, may present with cough, dyspnea, and wheezing, but it is often associated with fever and focal findings on chest examination. Pulmonary embolism, option D, typically presents with acute onset dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and hemoptysis, but wheezing is not a typical finding. Question 71. A 60-year-old patient presents with sudden onset severe chest pain that worsens with deep breathing or lying flat. Physical examination reveals pericardial friction rub. What condition is most likely causing these symptoms? A. Acute myocardial infarction. B. Pericarditis. C. Aortic dissection. D. Pulmonary embolism. Correct answer. B. Pericarditis. Explanation. The patient's symptoms of sudden onset severe chest pain worsened by deep breathing or lying flat, along with the presence of a pericardial friction rub on physical examination, are consistent with acute pericarditis. Pericarditis is characterized by inflammation of the pericardium, the membranous sac surrounding the heart, resulting in chest pain that may be pleuritic in nature and worsened by respiratory movements. Acute myocardial infarction. Option A, typically presents with chest pain that may be described as crushing or squeezing and is not typically affected by respiratory movements. Aortic dissection, option C, may present with sudden onset severe chest pain, but it is often described as tearing or ripping in nature and may be associated with other findings such as asymmetric blood pressure or pulse deficits. Pulmonary embolism, option D, typically presents with acute onset dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and may be associated with hemoptysis but it is not typically worsened by deep breathing or lying flat. Question 72. Mr. Anderson, a 55-year-old patient with a history of hypertension and diabetes, presents to the emergency department with sudden onset severe headache, neck stiffness, and photophobia. He reports feeling the worst headache of his life. What condition should be considered as the primary concern based on Mr. Anderson's presentation? A. Migraine headache. B. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. C. Tension headache. D. Cluster headache. Correct answer. B. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Explanation. Mr. Anderson's sudden onset severe headache, neck stiffness, photophobia, and description of the worst headache of his life were concerning for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a medical emergency characterized by bleeding into the subarachnoid space surrounding the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhage can result from a ruptured cerebral aneurysm or other vascular malformations and requires urgent evaluation and management to prevent complications such as cerebral vas spasm and rebleeding. Migraine headache, option A, typically presents with recurrent episodes of moderate to severe headache associated with photophobia, phonophobia, and nausea, but it does not typically present with sudden onset severe headache or neck stiffness. Tension headache, option C, is typically described as a bilateral 
been like headache with mild to moderate intensity and is not associated with photophobia or neck stiffness. Cluster headache, option D, is characterized by severe unilateral headache accompanied by autonomic symptoms such as lacrimation and nasal congestion, but it does not typically present with neck stiffness or photophobia. Question 73. A 35-year-old female presence to the emergency department with sudden onset right-sided pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea. She reports a recent long-haul flight. Vital signs reveal tachycardia and hypoxemia. What condition is most likely causing these symptoms? A. Pulmonary embolism. B. Pneumothorax. C. Acute coronary syndrome. D. Pleurisy. Correct answer. A. Pulmonary embolism. Explanation. The patient's sudden onset pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea, along with recent long-haul flight history and signs of tachycardia and hypoxemia, raise suspicion for pulmonary embolism, P, which is the obstruction of the pulmonary artery or its branches by a blood paw. Long periods of immobility during air travel increase the risk of deep vein thrombus DVT and subsequent P. Diagnosis often involves imaging studies such as CT pulmonary angiography. Prompt treatment with anticoagulation therapy is essential to prevent complications. Question 74. A 55-year-old male smoker presents with chronic cough, dyspnea, and weight loss. Chest x-ray reveals an irregularly shaped mass in the right upper lobe of the lung. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Lung cancer. B. Tuberculosis. C. Pneumonia. D. Bronchitosis. Correct answer. A. Lung cancer. Explanation. The patient's symptoms, along with the finding of an irregularly shaped mass on chest x-ray, are highly suggestive of lung cancer, particularly in a smoker. Lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related mortality worldwide and commonly presents with symptoms such as cough, dyspnea, weight loss, and hemoptysis. Additional diagnostic tests such as CT scan and biopsy may be performed to confirm the diagnosis and determine the stage of the cancer. Question 75. Mrs. Smith, a 65-year-old woman, presence with complaints of fatigue, palpitations, and shortness of breath on exertion. She has a history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Physical examination reveals an irregularly irregular pulse. What condition should be considered in the differential diagnosis based on Mrs. Smith's presentation? A. Atrial fibrillation. B. Atrial flutter. C. Ventricular tachycardia. D. Supraventricular tachycardia. Correct answer. A. Atrial fibrillation. Explanation. Mrs. Smith's symptoms, along with the finding of an irregularly irregular pulse on physical examination, are consistent with atrial fibrillation, half, the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia. AF is characterized by chaotic atrial electrical activity, leading to an irregular ventricular response and symptoms such as palpitations, fatigue, and dyspnea. Risk factors for AF include hypertension, diabetes, and advanced stage. Diagnosis is typically confirmed by electrocardiography. Ec management involves rate or rhythm control strategies and anticoagulation therapy to reduce the risk of thromboembolic events. Question 76. A 50-year-old male presence with sudden onset severe chest pain radiating to the left arm and jaw, diaphoresis, and nausea. His electrocardiogram Ec shows syntegment elevation in the anterior leads. What condition is most likely causing these symptoms? A. Acute myocardial infarction. B. Aortic dissection. C. Pulmonary embolism. D. Pericarditis. Correct answer. A. Acute myocardial infarction. Explanation. The patient's symptoms, along with the finding of syntegment elevation in the anterior leads on E. C. G. are consistent with acute myocardial infarction. AMI, commonly known as a heart attack. AMI results from the occlusion of a coronary artery, leading to myocardial ischemia and necrosis. Prompt recognition and intervention are crucial to minimize myocardial damage and improve outcomes. Management may involve reperfusion therapy, thrombolytics or percutaneous coronary intervention, and adjunctive medical therapy. Question 77. A 30-year-old female presence with recurrent episodes of headache, photophobia, and nausea. She reports a family history of similar symptoms. Physical examination is unremarkable between episodes. What condition is most likely causing these symptoms? A. Migraine headache. B. Cluster headache. C. Tension headache. D. Sinusitis. Correct answer. A. Migraine headache. Explanation. 
the patient's recurrent episodes of headache, photophobia, and nausea, along with a family history of similar symptoms, are consistent with migraine headache, a common neurological disorder characterized by episodic attacks of moderate to severe headache often associated with photophobia, phonophobia, and nausea. Migraine headaches can be triggered by various factors, including hormonal changes, stress, certain foods, and environmental factors. Management may involve lifestyle modifications, acute abortotherapy, and prophylactic medications. Question 70. Mr. Johnson, a 65-year-old male, presents with complaints of gradually worsening memory loss, confusion, and difficulty with daily activities over the past several months. His family reports personality changes and social withdrawal. Physical examination reveals bilateral cogal rigidity, a resting tremor. What condition should be considered in the differential diagnosis based on Mr. Johnson's presentation? A. Alzheimer's disease. B. Parkinson's disease. C. Frontopral dementia. D. Lewy body dementia. Correct answer. D. Lewy body dementia. Explanation. Mr. Johnson's symptoms, along with the presence of bilateral cogal rigidity and arresting tremor on physical examination, raise suspicion for Lewy body dementia IBD, a progressive neurodegenerative disorder characterized by cognitive decline, motor symptoms resembling Parkinson's disease, and psychiatric symptoms. LBD is the second most common form of degenerative dementia after Alzheimer's disease. Diagnosis is based on clinical criteria, which include the presence of cognitive impairment and two or more core features of LBD. Parkinsonism, visual hallucinations, and fluctuations in cognition or a level of consciousness. Management involves supportive care and symptomatic treatment. Question 79. A 40-year-old man with a history of alcohol use disorder is brought to the emergency room after a seizure. He is confused and agitated. Which of the following is the most likely cause of his seizure? A. Hypoglycemia. B. Alcohol withdrawal. C. Head trauma. D. Electrolyte imbalance. Correct answer. B. Alcohol withdrawal. Explanation. Alcohol withdrawal can cause seizures, typically within 12 to 48 hours after the last drink. This is due to the hyperexcitability of the central nervous system as it adapts to the sudden absence of alcohol, which is a depressant. Hypoglycemia, head trauma, and electrolyte imbalances can also cause seizures, but are less likely in the context of a known history of alcohol use disorder and the timing of the event. Early recognition and treatment of alcohol withdrawal are critical to prevent complications, including seizures and delirium tremens. Question 80. During a physical examination, a patient is unable to flex a wrist and fingers. Which nerve is most likely compromised? A. Radial nerve. B. Ulnar nerve. C. Median nerve. D. Musculocutaneous nerve. Correct answer. C. Median nerve. Explanation. The median nerve innervates most of the flexor muscles in the forearm, including those that flex the wrist and fingers. Damage to this nerve can impair these functions. The radial nerve primarily controls the extensor muscles of the forearm and hand. The ulnar nerve affects some of the intrinsic hand muscles and the flexor carpi ulnaris but does not have as broad an impact on wrist and finger flexion as the median nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve primarily innervates the flexor muscles of the upper arm and does not affect the wrist and fingers. Question 81. Mr. Johnson, a 28-year-old man, has been experiencing persistent hallucinations and delusions for the past three months. He believes that he is being followed by secret agents and hears voices commenting on his actions. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Brief psychotic disorder. B. Schizophrenia disorder. C. Schizophrenia. D. Schizoaffective disorder. Correct answer. B. Schizophrenia disorder. Explanation. Schizophrenia disorder is diagnosed when a patient experiences symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations and delusions, for at least one month but less than six months. If the symptoms persist for more than six months, the diagnosis is changed to schizophrenia. Brief psychotic disorder involves the sudden onset of psychotic symptoms that last for less than one month. Schizoaffective disorder includes symptoms of schizophrenia along with a mood disorder such as depression or bipolar disorder, which is not indicated in Mr. Johnson's case. Question 82. A patient with a lesion in the left optic tract would most likely experience which of the following visual field defects? A. Bidemporal hemianopia. B. Right homonymous hemianopia. C. Left homonymous hemianopia. D. Complete blindness in the left eye. Correct answer. B. Right homonymous hemianopia. Explanation. A lesion in the left optic tract results in right homonymous hemianopia, where there is loss of vision in the right visual fields of both eyes. 
The optic tract carries information from the contralateral visual fields of both eyes. A bitemporal hemianopia results from a lesion at the optic chiasm, affecting the outer, temporal, visual fields of both eyes. Complete blindness in the left eye would result from a lesion affecting the left optic nerve before the optic chiasm. A left homonymous hemianopia would be caused by a lesion in the right optic tract. Question 83. Dr. Kim is examining a biopsy sample under the microscope. She observes cells that are tall, with nuclei located at different heights within the cells, giving a stratified appearance, but all cells are in contact with the basement membrane. What type of epithelium is she most likely observing? A. Simple columnar epithelium. B. Stratified columnar epithelium. C. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. D. Transitional epithelium. Correct answer. C. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Explanation. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium appears to be stratified because the nuclei are at different heights, but it is actually a single layer of cells with all cells in contact with the basement membrane. This type of epithelium is commonly found lining the respiratory tract, where it often has cilia. Simple columnar epithelium consists of a single layer of tall cells with nuclei at the same level, while stratified columnar epithelium has multiple layers of columnar cells. Transitional epithelium found in the urinary bladder has a different appearance and allows for stretching. Question 84. A 50-year-old female patient is undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer and is experiencing significant emotional distress. Which of the following interventions has been shown to be effective in reducing anxiety and improving quality of life in cancer patients? A. Routine exercise. B. Cognitive behavioral therapy CBT. C. Avoiding discussing the cancer. D. High-dose benzodiazepines. Correct answer. B. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy CBT. Explanation. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy CBT has been shown to be effective in reducing anxiety and improving the quality of life in cancer patients. CBT helps patients manage their thoughts and emotions and develop coping strategies. Routine exercise can also be beneficial, but it is not as directly targeted towards emotional distress as CBT. Avoiding discussion of the cancer is not helpful and can increase anxiety. High-dose benzodiazepines may provide short-term relief but are not suitable for long-term management due to risks of dependence and side effects. Question 85. A 28-year-old woman presents with a history of recurrent miscarriages and deep vein thrombosis. Genetic testing reveals a mutation in the factor V gene. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Hemophilia A. B. Factor V-laden mutation. C. Von Willebrand disease. D. Prothrombin gene mutation. Correct answer. B. Factor V. Leiden mutation. Explanation. The factor V. Leiden mutation is a genetic disorder that leads to an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. This mutation makes factor V resistant to an activation by activated protein C, resulting in a hypercoagulable state. Hemophilia is isca deficiency of factor V. I. 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 in presence with bleeding tendencies, not thrombosis. Von Willebrand disease is a bleeding disorder due to deficient or defective von Willebrand factor. The prothrombin gene mutation. GAU also increases the risk of thrombosis, but is not as commonly associated with recurrent miscarriages as the factor V-laden mutation. Question 86. Miss Johnson, a 45-year-old woman with a history of diabetes, presents with fever and a swollen erythematous leg wound. Cultures from the wound grow gram-positive cocci in chains that are catalase negative. Which organism is most likely causing her infection? A. Staphylococcus aureus. B. Streptococcus pyogenes. C. Enterococcus fecalis. D. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Correct answer. B. Streptococcus pyogenes. Explanation. Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as group of streptococcus, is a gram-positive coccus that forms chains and is catalase negative. It is a common cause of skin and soft tissue infections, including cellulitis, especially in patients with diabetes. Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive coccus that forms clusters and is catalase-positive. Enterococcus fecalis is a gram-positive coccus that forms chains or pairs and is catalase-negative, but is less commonly associated with cellulitis. Streptococcus pneumoniae is a gram-positive coccus that typically appears in pairs and is primarily associated with respiratory infections, not wound infections. Question 87. A 16-year-old girl presents with recurrent infections and chronic diarrhea. Laboratory tests show low levels of immunoglobulins and normal numbers of B and T cells. Which immunodeficiency disorder is most likely? A. Severe Combined Immunodeficiency, CID. B. Common Variable Immunodeficiency, CVID. 
C. Hyperam syndrome. D. Selective agar deficiency. Correct answer. B. Common variable immune deficiency. C. Vid. Explanation. Common variable immune deficiency. C. Vid is characterized by low levels of immunoglobulins, IgIgA, and Offenheim, despite normal numbers of B and T cells. It leads to recurrent infections and chronic gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea. Severe combined immune deficiency, SID, involves profound defects in both T and B cell function, leading to severe infections early in life. Hyperime syndrome results from defects in CD ligand or CD, causing elevated IM levels and low levels of other immunoglobulins. Selective agar deficiency involves low levels of agar but normal levels of other immunoglobulins and typically presents with milder symptoms than CVID. Question 88. Dr. Smith is treating a patient with a metabolic disorder characterized by an inability to metabolize branched-chain amino acids. What dietary recommendations should Dr. Smith provide to manage this condition? A. Increase protein intake. B. Avoid foods high in phenylalanine. C. Avoid foods high in leucine, isoleucine, and valine. D. Increase carbohydrate intake. Correct answer. C. Avoid foods high in leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Explanation. The patient likely has maple syrup urine disease, MSUD, a metabolic disorder caused by a deficiency in the branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, which is responsible for metabolizing branch chain amino acids leucine, isoleucine, and valine. To manage MSUD, patients should avoid foods high in these amino acids. Increasing protein intake would exacerbate the condition. Avoiding phenylalanine is relevant to phenylketonuria, PQU, not MSUD. Increasing carbohydrate intake is not directly relevant to managing MSUD, as the issue is with branched-chain amino acid metabolism. Question 89. A researcher is studying a bacterium that causes gastrointestinal illness. It is a gram-negative rod, facultatively anaerobic, and produces a shiga-like toxin. Which organism is the researcher most likely studying? A. Salmonella enterica. B. Escherichia coleo. C. Vibrio cari. D. Shigella dysenteri. Correct answer. B. Escherichia coleo. Explanation. Escherichia coleo is a pathogenic strain of E. coli that produces a shigalite toxin and causes hemorrhagic colitis and hemolytic uremic syndrome, as it is a gram-negative rod and facultatively anaerobic. Salmonella enterica causes gastroenteritis and typhoid fever but does not produce shigalite toxin. Vibrio cholerae causes cholera through the production of cholera toxin, not shiga-like toxin. Shigella dysenteri produces shiga toxin but is not. A facultatively anaerobic cram negative rata is typically associated with more severe dysentery. Question 90. A patient is found to have elevated levels of homocysteine in the blood. Which vitamin deficiency is most likely associated with this finding? A. Vitamin B. Thiamon. B. Vitamin B. B. Pyridoxine. C. Vitamin B. B. Cobalamin. D. Vitamin C, ascorbic acid. Correct answer. C. Vitamin B, cobalamin. Explanation. Elevated levels of homocysteine in the blood can be associated with deficiencies in vitamins B, B, and folate, as these vitamins are involved in the metabolism of homocysteine. Vitamin B, B deficiency is commonly associated with elevated homocysteine and can lead to megaloblastic anemia and neurological symptoms. Vitamin B, B pyridoxine, is also involved in homocysteine metabolism but less commonly causes elevated homocysteine alone. Vitamin B, thiamine, deficiency is associated with Beriberi and Wernicorsakoff syndrome, not elevated homocysteine. Vitamin C, ascorbic acid, deficiency leads to scurvy and is not involved in homocysteine metabolism.